Welcome to Hibbert Health. Dr. Paul Merrick is here to join me today. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Merrick. Sure, it's my privilege to be here talking with you. Thank you. Dr. Merrick is a board certified internal medicine specialist, board certified in critical care medicine, neurocritical care, internal medicine, and nutrition science. He's professor of medicine and chief of pulmonary and critical care medicine at East Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia. He's author of over 450 peer reviewed journal articles, 80 book chapters, and four critical care books. Dr. Merrick is cited in over 36,000 peer-reviewed publications. He's delivered over 350 lectures at international conferences and visiting professorships. He's recipient of numerous teaching awards and the second most published critical care doctor in the world. Okay, you have to tell me, who's the most published? Yeah, so that's a gentleman. Because that's like so, like, it's like, oh, come on. <laughs> Yeah, so you know what, um, so his name is Jean-Louis Vincent, he lives in Belgium, he owns a journal, and he publishes, I'm not sure he's a patient, he's the most published critical care person. Every paper that I published, I, almost 90% of them I wrote myself and was involved in them, so, you know, I'm certainly not a ghost writer. That's wonderful to hear. Now, Dr. Merrick, formed the FLCCC, which is the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance. He is their intellectual leader and they're devoted to prophylaxis and treatment protocols for COVID-19. They're a team of highly published ICU critical care physicians and scholars who have conducted a comprehensive analysis of rapidly accumulating scientific data from around the world, supporting the efficacy of repurposed oral medication. This data is consistent, reproducible, highly effective, safe, inexpensive, and a globally available agent for prevention and treatment of COVID-19. Dr. Merrick and his team devised the Math Plus for the hospitalized patients earlier on dealing with COVID-19. And as time progressed, they developed the iMask protocol, which will revolutionize treatment for COVID-19 for prophylaxis and early outpatient combination treatment. Dr. Merrick, can you please talk about all of this? <laughs> you know, in March, we saw the tsunami coming and I have a number of colleagues. So we kind of got together and started speaking about, you know, how best to manage these patients because we were not getting guidance from anybody. So at that point, and this is March, we put together a treatment protocol, which we called Math Plus. And this was based on, at that time, the best scientific evidence. And I must stress that we look at the science and also our experience at the bedside and our knowledge of treating sepsis because COVID and sepsis kind of overlap. So at that time, we came up with the Meth Plus protocol. The most important piece of it was methylprednisolone. Corticosteroids save lives in critically ill people in the hospital. Because in our hospital and that of Dr. Verone in Houston, he's really a COVID demon. The hospital mortality is less than 5%. The hospital mortality around the world, and this is in Western countries, is 23%. 23% of people hospitalized with COVID across the world on average die. That is awful. That's why people don't want to be hospitalized. In our hands, the mortality is less than 5%. The central element is the use of corticosteroids. We then added a whole bunch of other medications, including anticoagulation, which is central. You have to understand the disease to treat the disease because we know, and we, and we know this for a fact, that COVID results, severe COVID, in a hypercoagulable state with thrombosis. This is clotting, clotting in the small vessels and big vessels. And it's not rocket science to figure out that the way you treat this is with an anticoagulant and we recommended heparin. So the combination of corticosteroids and heparin formed the basis of the Math Plus protocol, which we'll come to shortly. But you know what, we figured out that the later patients present to hospital 
the more difficult it is to treat. This is not the flu. This is not like any other disease we have seen. When people come in the late pulmonary phase, they have extensive organizing pneumonia. My colleague, Pierre Corey has well described this. So once they get organizing pneumonia, it's a progressive disease, which is very difficult to reverse. And the later they present, the more difficult it is to reverse. And these people suffocate to death. So this is not a quick death. They die over weeks. They die in isolation, isolated from their family. This is an awful, awful disease. The toll on healthcare workers who witness this are poor nurses and the poor patients and their families, their patients die alone. So we figured out, you know what, we have to do everything we can to intervene early so that patients do not progress to this stage. Just basic common sense. What you wanna do is prevent the disease and you can prevent this by wearing a mask and, and that's indoors. So when you're indoors and you're not with your close family, you need to wear a mask. It's spread by droplets. It's as simple as that. When you're outdoors is a somewhat different situation because of ventilation. But I think even when you're outdoors, you want to avoid big crowds. You want to avoid big gatherings. You know, this is a serious disease. People are dying. This is not the flu. So preventative healthcare measures are absolutely critical. So if you go to the supermarket, you want to wear a mask, social distance. You want to avoid big gatherings. There's no question that big gatherings cause spread of this disease. There was this completely ridiculous motorcycle event in South Dakota. Motorcyclists got together and it probably wasn't the motorcycle part. It was the socializing afterwards led to 220,000 people getting COVID. That event cost the healthcare system in excess of $13 billion. So there is absolutely no question that group gatherings cause spread of this disease. Why people don't get it is beyond me. Wearing a mask indoors is not a big deal. Avoiding social gatherings. And you know, with Christmas coming up, people have to say, you know what, this is not the time for a social gathering. If you wanna have a social gathering, let's wait until next year when this is gone. Because if you have a social gathering this year, you may not be able to have one next year because the people at your gathering may be dead. We know, we know for a fact, this is not fiction. If somebody in the group or your family has COVID, 50% of people in your family will get COVID. It's just that simple. So that's the overview. Wow. So maybe you wanted to show my first phases slide. Absolutely. So this slide shows the time, course, and approach to therapy. Now, what is absolutely critical, it's critical for the public to be aware of this. It's critical for doctors to be aware of this. And it's critical for healthcare authorities and decision makers to be aware of this. And unfortunately, they are not. So as you'll see, this disease goes through a number of phases. Firstly, there's the incubation period, which is about five days. And you note that viral replication is greatest before patients become symptomatic. Now, about 20 to 40% of people who are actually incubating the virus are asymptomatic and may remain asymptomatic. But during this asymptomatic phase, they have billions of viruses in the nasopharynx and just by breathing, exhale billions of virons. So they are highly infectious. So about 40 to 60% will then progress to the symptomatic phase. And the symptomatic phase is what we all know, fever, feeling bad, weakness, cough, headache, diarrhea the general kind of flu-like symptoms, but this is not flu. What's interesting is elderly patients may not present with these findings and may present with confusion. 
So if you have an elderly person in your family who becomes confused and disoriented, you have to think of COVID. Then as you'll see, they go through this symptomatic phase. About 80% of patients will get better. However, about 20% will progress to the pulmonary phase. And we kind of know who these people are. These are people over the age of 60, people with comorbidities, people with hypertension. Obesity is a profound risk factor. Unfortunately, people of color have a higher risk of progressing. So then they progress to the pulmonary phase. Now in the pulmonary phase, the, obviously the lung gets involved and patients then start developing short of breath. But also what happens is their oxygen levels in their blood goes down. Some patients have low blood oxygen levels and yet have no symptoms. This is called the silent hypoxia. Now, what's interesting, when they go into this phase, this is not due to the virus. We need to be clear. This is not due to the virus killing the host. This is the patient's response, his immune response to dead virus. We know that by the 10th day of symptoms, almost all patients no longer have active viral replication. So the symptomatic phase is the host's very bizarre immune response to dead virus. We call this the immune dysregulation phase, which results in severe dysfunction with uh, an abnormal innate immunity and abnormal adaptive immunity. So it gets profound immune dysfunction. And it's this immune dysfunction which causes the organizing pneumonia. Now, understanding these phases is critical to treating patients because it's kind of obvious. You want to use antiviral therapy in the incubation or symptomatic phase because that's when the virus is replicating. Once the virus is dead, giving antiviral therapy is a waste of time. And this becomes important because remdesivir, which is an antiviral, is now the drug promoted by the NIH to treat people in hospital. Okay, and you can see that's pretty dumb. Okay, because the virus has stopped replicating. So this is why the time course and the approach to treatment is very much phase specific. The incubation and symptomatic phase, you want to use drugs which have antiviral activity. And probably the most important is ivermectin. We know ivermectin has potent properties against this virus. We then add in some of other pharmacological agents whose basic premise is to improve the host's immune response. It does so happen that quercetin and zinc directly have antiviral effects. However, once you progress into the pulmonary phase, you have to use Anti-inflammatory therapy, giving direct antiviral therapy does not work. So we know from the recovery study that corticosteroids reduce the risk of death in hospitalized patients. We prefer methylprednisolone because we think it's the preferred corticosteroid. So once pa patients enter the pulmonary phase, we treat them with methylprednisolone, which is a corticosteroid. As I said, these people have profound clotting. So what do you do? You give them an anticoagulant. And we're now recommending aspirin and anoxaparin, which is a subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin. Now, what is truly astonishing, you know, ivermectin was really a gift to us. This was a gift. Ivermectin, in addition to being antiviral, has profound anti-inflammatory properties. So we know when ivermectin is given to critically ill patients in the ICU, when given on top of methylprednisolone, it decreases the risk of death. Now, Dr. Raja in Florida, he proved conclusively 
that if you give ivermectin to critically ill people, it reduces the risk of death. So you can see this is our approach to therapy in the symptomatic phase and in the immune dysregulation phase. This slide does not talk about prophylaxis, which we'll get to in the next slide, which is the iMask protocol. So as I said, because we want to do whatever we can to prevent patients coming to hospital and landing in ICU, we came up with the IMAS protocol. So I got an email yesterday from a patient who was desperate who said, I have COVID. I spoke to my doctor and my doctor said, there's nothing I can do. You must stay at home until you get blue and you cannot breathe. Let me say that again. The doctor said to the patient, you stay at home, there's nothing I can do. When you get blue or you can't breathe, go to the emergency department. That is medical malpractice because there are things we can do to prevent patients going to the hospital. So that's why we came up with the eye mask protocol. So we talk about prophylaxis. There are a few types. There's pre-exposure prophylaxis. So pre-exposure prophylaxis is prophylaxis, which you take chronically for people that are high risk of getting COVID. So these would be people in long-term care facilities, because we know about 40% of people in long-term care facilities will get COVID and die. And we can prevent that. The second obvious group is healthcare workers. And the last group is the very elderly people with comorbidities. So that's pre-exposure prophylaxis. We then talk about post-exposure prophylaxis. So as I said, if someone in your family has COVID, the likelihood that you will get COVID is 50%, i.e. half the people in your family will get COVID. So we know if we prophylax them with ivermectin, and this is based on randomized controlled trials. So this is not weak data. This is based on randomized controlled trials. So if you treat household contacts with ivermectin, you will significantly reduce the risk from about 50% to about 4 to 5%. So that people who are exposed to COVID should be on this prophylactic protocol because we know, you just watch the news, husband gets it, the wife gets it, and the two seem to die together at the same time. It's an absolute tragedy. So this can be stopped. So that's pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis. And then the third is early outpatient treatment. So the moment you get diagnosed with COVID or you think you have COVID, you want to take this protocol. So to look at the prophylactic protocol, it's based on ivermectin. So the post-exposure prophylaxis, generally the dose is 0.2 milligrams per kilogram, which works out at about 12 milligrams. And that's dosed on day one and day three. Now, the chronic prophylactic dose is a little bit unclear. A recent study out of Argentina prophylaxed healthcare workers with ivermectin 150 micrograms per kilogram weekly. In this study, what they did is there were 800 healthcare workers who got ivermectin and there were 400 who didn't. They were treated for 10 weeks. Out of the 800 that got ivermectin, not a single healthcare worker got COVID. Let me say that again. Not a single healthcare worker got COVID. In the 400 patients who didn't, 58% got COVID. So we know it's effective up to 10 weeks. After 10 weeks, we're not sure what to do. So we think that take it weekly for 10 weeks and thereafter take it monthly. Again, the same dose, 0.2 milligrams per kilogram or about 12 milligrams. Now, obviously, you know, this is evolving as we get the most up-to-date data. It's really important to stress. In, in addition, we add vitamin D, vitamin C, quercetin, zinc, and melatonin. So melatonin is used to promote sleep, but remarkably data has shown people who take melatonin, particularly African-American people, 
have a significantly reduced risk of getting COVID. Melatonin is probably one of the safest medications on the planet. You cannot actually give enough melatonin to an animal to kill it. It's impossible. It's very safe. So that's our prophylactic protocol. But really, what's really important is the early outpatient protocol. So these are people who have COVID who are at home. What we suggest is you don't wait until you go blue and can't breathe. What we suggest is you start our early outpatient protocol, which consists of ivermectin, 0.2 milligrams per kilogram, day one and day three, it works out about 12 milligrams. If you're a heavier person, maybe 15 milligrams. That's it. Vitamin D, vitamin C, quercetin, zinc, melatonin. And we add aspirin at this point because of the clotting. Many patients at this stage develop clotting. There's data to support this, that early outpatient treatment prevents progression of this disease progression of COVID and so that you don't land up in hospital and die. It's simple and it's safe. All the medications on this list are exceedingly safe. Ivermectin has been used since 1975. 3.7 billion, that's with a B, 3.7 billion people have been treated with ivermectin for parasitic diseases. As I said, miraculously, ivermectin also has antiviral effects. It's completely safe. It is on the World Health Organization, the WHO's list of essential medications. It is safe and it is cheap. So in terms of acute treatment, we have no problems in recommending it. As I said, chronically, we're still looking at the data. But if you are at home sick with COVID symptoms, this is the protocol we recommend. Vitamin D3, zinc, melatonin, vitamin C, quercetin, aspirin, and ivermectin. As we said, 200 micrograms per kilogram daily for two days, day one and day three. Now, when we get to vitamin D3, there have been studies with vitamin D3 recently that were negative. And this is because it takes time for vitamin D to be metabolized to the active form. So we think if you take vitamin D upfront, both in prophylaxis and acutely, it's more likely to have a benefit. Now, this is important because, especially in winter, especially if you're in the north, you're going to be vitamin D deficient. And the data is absolutely clear. People with vitamin D insufficient have a higher risk of getting COVID. They have a higher risk of dying from COVID. We recommend zinc. Now, it depends on whether you're taking compound or elemental zinc. So the dose of elemental zinc is 50 milligrams. If you're taking the combination with sulfate or whatever, it's 220 milligrams. Zinc actually is important because not only does it improve your immune system, particularly your T lymphocytes, it actually inhibits viral replication. But in order to get it into the cell, you need what's called a zinc ionophore. This is a molecule which increases concentration in the cell. Quercetin, as it so happens miraculously, is a zinc ionophore. So you can see all these compounds act interchangeably, synergistically, and additively. Interestingly, vitamin C potentiates the activity of quercetin and prevents it from being broken down. A recent study out of Turkey showed that healthcare workers who were taking vitamin C and quercetin had a significantly lower risk of getting COVID than the control group. This is based on the best available scientific data. We encourage patients at home to take this medication cocktail. This will hopefully prevent progression because if patients have some reassurance that they're not going to get sick and go to hospital, that maybe they'll be more proactive. 
But I must say that once patients start developing lung signs, that is the time to go to hospital. Do not stay at home because the earlier you treat this, the easier it is to reverse. So as part of the eye mask protocol for people that are symptomatic at home, what we recommend is for people to monitor their oxygen saturation in their blood. This is the amount of oxygen that the blood is carrying. Because as I said, COVID involves the lung and the oxygen levels go down. In a number of patients, the oxygen levels go down and the patients are not aware of this. This is called silent hypoxia. But what we recommend is people buy this little device. It's ready available from health stores, from your pharmacy. This is a pulse oximeter. You put it on your finger and it measures the saturation of blood. And we recommend you do this a few times a day and you do this while you're walking. Because if your saturation falls when you walk, this means your lungs are already involved. So if your pulse ox falls consistently between 92%, what you do is you go directly to the hospital. You do not want to wait until it's 60% or 40%, because at that time you have severe lung disease and are likely to die. So what we're emphasizing is prevention, early treatment at home, and for those patients who progress to the pulmonary phase to go to hospital early and be treated early. If you do this, you will not be intubated and we can treat it before it progresses. It's an absolute travesty when people are short of breath for weeks at end and nothing is done. That becomes very difficult to treat this disease. The sooner we get this pandemic under control, the sooner we can get back to normal. We know absolutely that people getting together in groups will result in the spread of this virus. There's a famous case or scenario in South Korea in which one woman got infected, she went to church, and through multiple contacts, one patient spread COVID to over 5,000 people. 5,000. This is a serious disease. So if we take basic healthcare precautions, wear a mask, socially distance, avoid group gatherings, we can get this disease under control. And we can get it under control by pre-exposure prophylaxis, post-exposure prophylaxis, and early treatment. And that is our plea. Now we have all this information on our website. If people would like additional information, so that's flccc.net, which is the frontline critical care collaborative. And we have all the required information there, the Math Plus protocol, the IMASC protocol. So we are appealing to people out there, healthcare providers and people who are healthcare administrators. We are facing a terrible tragedy. In the US, over 200,000 people people get infected a day, over 2,000 are dying. We need to do something right now. Thanks, Jennifer. So once again, thank you, thank you, thank you for helping us spread this very important message. Thank you so much for taking the time to share this message. It's so important for humanity. We're reaching out to the world to try to help everybody pay attention watch what's going on around them and be cautious and careful and listen and read. This is so important to learn about. Thank you so much for joining me on Hibbert Health. And for everybody listening, please subscribe to my YouTube channel so you can see new videos as they do get uploaded. Thank you very much.